and we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, I don't know about the majority of you, but raise your hands if you have an investment property. Okay. Wow. Raise your hand if you don't have an investment property. All right. Okay. So um, about a year ago, I decided I want to get involved in investment property, but the only thing uh, that I could find online were a lot of uh, salesman websites that were trying to sell me a product or go to Donald Trump's school for 40 grand, which is a type of money I don't have. So I went online, you know, I checked Wikipedia, I looked for numerous websites to educate myself on real estate, and I eventually came across biggerpockets.com. And by using the website, what was amazing is they have a community uh, based upon real estate investment um, with investors who come from all different walks of life, from people who are full-time real estate investors to people who um, real estate as a hobby, I do real estate investment as a hobby. So by using that website, I was able to educate myself and eventually uh, buy my first investment property. Um, so we're lucky to have uh, Josh um, Dorkin, who is the CEO of Bigger Pockets, and we also have Brandon Turner, um, who is a VP of Marketing. They're going to come down here and tell you guys about real estate and how you guys can get involved in it while working a full-time job. So let's hear it from Brandon and Josh. Thank you, Jordan. Another Bigger Pocket success story, right there. All right, so as, as uh, Jordan introduced, my name is Josh. I am the founder of biggerpockets.com. And really quickly, uh, as, as Jordan was talking about, he's, he was out there looking for information and he uh, kept coming across these kind of you know, shady characters who, who dominated the space. So when I started almost 10 years ago as a real estate investor, I was dealing with the exact same thing. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, and I, as I like to say, my bs meter is pretty finely attuned. And when I came across these guys, I said, you know, this, this is crazy. You know, there's got to be another way to get information. And, and so I set out to kind of democratize real estate investing information because I was in need of it, and uh, I realized that other people would be as well. Uh, so that is uh, the, the birth of bigger pockets. But uh, we're, we're not here to teach you to be real estate investors. You're not going to learn how to become a real estate investor today. You're not going to go out tomorrow and get rich uh, from anything that we say. But hopefully we give you guys some fundamentals, some basics that will help you maybe get a better understanding of what's out there and, and hopefully we'll get, point you to uh, some, some tools and possibilities that will uh, get you on your way. So that's me. And uh, next to me is the big guy, uh, clearly. He's quite large. And uh, this is Brandon Turner. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Brandon, as he said, and Jordan said. And I just want to say again, thank you, Jordan, for having us out here. Uh, so I started real estate investing at 21 years old. I'm 28 right now. Uh, bought my first property at 21. Uh, I live in an area that's a lot cheaper than you guys live in up here. So I was able to buy probably more properties faster than a lot of people can. So by the time I was 25, I was able to quit my job and retire, so to speak. Uh, as much as you can retire when you own a lot of rental property. Uh, I quickly figured out that that wasn't very fun to be uh, you know, retired. So I ended up uh, starting a blog, helping out Josh Dork in here, and ended up coming on board. So that's how I got here. Uh, I started real estate investing uh, in a similar way as I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I wanted to be in real estate. I wanted to get in involved. I called up my dad and I said, all right, dad, I know what I'm going to do for a living now. I'm going to be a real estate investor. And he said, you're an idiot. I mean, essentially was the word he said. Uh, he said, you're going to go homeless, you're going to go broke, uh, your tenants are not going to pay rent, and you're going to lose everything. So I'm like, crap. Like, that's what's going to happen in my life. You're right. All right, well, I'll go back to law school or go work at Google or something. So I decided instead, I went, on, I went online and I, I typed in what to do when tenants don't pay rent. And what I discovered was, uh, first of all, bigger pockets. That's how I first found them. And what I discovered was that there were a community of people. Like, I mean, there's real estate investors out there who like to share what they know and that's exactly what we're about today we want to share what we've learned uh, the mistakes we've made and what we've done right kind of help each other out so you don't have to pay big money to do that so with that uh why don't we get started talking about the seven steps to get started investing in real estate with jokes hopefully so feel free you know we we want to have a good time doing this um you know so pretend to laugh even if we're not funny so see all right all right first of all before we get into it let's talk about why real estate investing. I'm gonna start out just by talking about diversification. It's a big word, basically means we don't want all of our eggs in one basket. 
lot of you guys probably have uh, stocks or whatever. If you have all your stuff in one basket, you're setting yourself up for a lot greater risk. All right, so we've got control. One of the nice things about real estate is you actually have more control than with a, with a stock or a bond or things like that. The stock you're buying, you're hoping that the CEO of the company is doing the right thing, the employees are doing their jobs and everything's gonna go well. Uh, in terms of uh, real estate, you can actually control a lot of what happens. So you can, you, can, uh, you can manage purchase price, you can manage the maintenance, you can manage who you put in there. So having that control gives you a little more power over your investment. All right, leverage. Uh, how many of you guys went to summer camp as a kid? Nobody summer camp? All right, a few people. All right, so one of my memories of summer camp was the teeter-totter, or do you say seesaw? Is seesaw. It seesaw. Well, whatever. Teeter-totter, seesaw, seesaw, you know the thing, right? Uh, or for the science people, we're talking about like a fulcrum, is that the word? Right, so leverage is the idea of moving large objects with small amount. I remember I was like, I was the, the big, you know, fat kid at camp. And so like, you could like, depending on where you sat on the teeter-totter, you could move large objects. So. That's the idea with real estate investing. With a small amount of money, you can move a large amount of uh, property, which is one of my favorite things about it. All right, and of course, the most important thing is financial freedom. We're all here, we're working, we're doing these things to support our friends, our family. Well, hopefully you're not supporting your friends, but you're supporting your families. And uh, <laughs> the, the ultimate end all be all American dream is, is financial freedom, right? So real estate is definitely another means to an end to get there. Uh, you, uh, you know, you may end up getting uh, to a point with your real estate career where Google doesn't work for you anymore and you're working for yourself. I don't know that, you know, <laughs> the big guy wants to hear that, but, uh, you know, that might happen. And, and, and that's, you know, again, that's the goal because in the end you're going to take that money and you're going to do what with it. You're going to give it to your family and you're going to do all the things that you're looking for. So real estate investing, we get into it because ultimately we're tr trying to have a better life for ourselves and our families. All right, let's get started. If you guys are writing this down or taking notes on your computer, uh, I'm just gonna go through, well, we're gonna go through all seven steps. So step number one is to get educated. Uh, now, when a lot of people think of getting educated, uh, just as Jordan said earlier, uh, they think of this. So, oh, there it is. All right, so we got the snake oil salesman uh, who's always advertising uh, how you can get rich, you can get the girl in the bikini, and you can get the red convertible. For some reason, those three things always go together on the late night TV infomercials. That's not what we're talking about today. So try to get that out of your mind, please. All right. So there, there are other ways to go. You don't have to spend. Ultimately, what these guys do is there's this kind of dominance over the information space that they've kind of projected out there. You hear it, hear it on the commercials. You see it at these seminars. Uh, they have these funnels where, you know, come to this free event and you're going to learn all about real estate investing. Well, these free events are really lead funnels to get you to spend $997, to get you to spend $19,000, to get you to spend $50,000. Next thing you know, you've given them all your money and you've got nothing. Uh, there are other ways you can go. You can, you've got books, you've got blogs, mentors, forums, podcasts, YouTube. There is enough information out on the web, as you guys know, who own the web, uh, that... Uh, you can pretty much learn the entire business online or at the library, things like that, but you don't have to depend on these guys. Um, ultimately, with education, the key is you want to know what you're getting into here, okay? If you go, I, I'll give an example of myself. I started real estate investing. I was a smart guy, not quite a Googler, but I was fairly intelligent, and I thought I could do it all. Somebody, my brother said to me, hey, Josh, you should buy some real estate. I said, great. I went, I bought some real estate, not knowing anything. So like I'm smart enough to figure it out. Well, the, very quickly I realized I was not smart enough to figure it out on my own. I ended up over a period of time losing about $100,000 off of uh, the, the first investments that I got involved in. It was because I didn't have the education. I didn't have the full understanding of what I needed to do. And again, that, that kind of goes back to the origins of, my, uh, of this website, uh, Bigger Pockets, was uh, be, because ultimately I needed the answers. I needed a place to go. The nice thing about uh, the mentors and the nice thing about groups like our site or, or other uh, groups, clubs, things like that, where you can get educated is you can support, uh, count on the support of other people to help you out. And it really is important in real estate to have that support net to help you uh, get going. Very true. All right, step number two is to choose your niche and your strategy. This is the way that I like to explain it because real estate and get investing can be really overwhelming because it's so broad. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, first of all, there's niches and there's strategies when you're investing. Oh, we're not up there anymore. Well, all right, well, I'll just talk. Basically, there are niches 
And there are strategies, right? So niches would be like the actual property types you're buying. Uh, for example, you got single family, multifamily, commercial, notes, raw land, uh, anything like that. It's actual like property types. On the other side of the equation, you have different strategies that you can use. So for example, you might want to flip a house. Have you guys ever seen the flipping shows? How many of you have seen flipping shows? The TV, yeah, all right. So that's a strategy, uh, not necessarily. Uh, another strategy would be buy and hold. That's where you buy something and hold onto it. Uh, other could be live in investments, things like that, that you hold onto while you're living inside of it. For example, if you live in a duplex, you live in half of it, that's also a strategy. So the problem with real estate investing is that it gets really, really overwhelming for a lot of people because they see all this stuff and all these people say, no, you should do this and this and this and this. What we recommend is just choose one niche and just choose one strategy. So for example, you might want to flip single family houses. Great. So learn about flipping single family houses. You might want to uh, buy and hold commercial properties. That's okay too. You might want to do a live in uh, multifamily property. So you don't need to know everything in the world to get started in real estate. Just pick one thing, get good at that one thing, and then move on from there. So uh, with that, we're going to move on to the next slide here. Yeah, all right. All right, so we're going to have about jobs versus investing. I'll let Josh take that one. Sure. Just Sorry, I'm screwing this one out of <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about job versus active versus uh, passive. So with, with real estate, there's, there's really uh, two ways to go. You can say, hey, I'm going to be an active real estate investor or I'm going to be a passive real estate investor. House flipping shows that Brandon had talked about, you're an active real estate investor. You're out there, you're finding the property, you're picking the color, you're you know, dealing with the contractors, dealing with the headaches. Yeah, it, it's a job. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Flipping houses is a job. Uh, passive is really, it's, it's more like, excuse me, Passive is, uh, is, is where it, it's what it says, right? Passive is like buying a stock, you, you, essentially, but a little bit more work. You, you, you purchase, you sit back, and you kind of wait for things to happen. In passive, for example, buy and hold, you're going to be depending upon a uh, property manager who's going to watch the property and do most of the work. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but ultimately, there is not one right way to invest, as Brandon had said earlier. Uh, However, we definitely recommend you choose that one niche and that one strategy. It may not be the right one, but pick one and go with it. Because uh, if, you're, if you're worried about every other strategy that's out there or every other niche that's out there, you're gonna get really, it, it's gonna cause you to kind of get confused and, and ultimately in the end, people will never act. That's one of the biggest things that we see with new real estate investors is they fail to act because there's just so much information out there and they don't really know where to go, which leads us to the development of your plan. All right, so number three, we talked about number one and two. Number three is gonna be to develop your plan. Uh, I like to explain it like this. I'm from the Seattle area. I would not generally get in my car and go and drive, you know, 3,500 miles to Mexico City just knowing that it's south, right? Uh, anybody work on the Google Maps department here? I don't know if you guys do that. All right, so thankfully we have maps, things like Google Maps, that we can get in our car and drive and follow uh, somebody who's already done it. So that's what developing your plan is. It's about getting a starting point and ending point and knowing where you're ending up at. So uh, we're going to explain just a couple sample plans because. I don't like to be always theoretical. Let's get actually uh, realistic here. So first plan I want to talk about is buying single family houses. Again, these are just samples. So bear with me on this example. You might buy single family houses and you might say, okay, well, I want to buy a single family house that provides $200 per month in passive cash flow. So every month I have $200 left over after all the bills, including property management, whatever I'm paid for. I want $200 left. And I only want to put down $20,000. Okay, so that's the beginning of our plan. Then you're going to say, well, I'm going to buy one property in year one. I need the math people here to, to, to listen closely here. One in year one, two in year two, three in year three, and so on, all the way up to year 10. Any geniuses in here know how many after year 10, how many you'd have? Anybody? Any, anybody? 55. 55, smart guy there. All right. So anyway, you have 55 houses and uh, 1,100 per month in passive cash thousand. flow. 11,000 per month in passive cash flow which can be a nice, in 10 years, a nice addition. And that's building real slowly, right? Just one in year one, two in year two. Uh, it's all about a plan, right? So that's just one sample plan you might uh, look into. Another sample plan might be to start with small multifamily properties that provide a 15% return on investment. Again, buy one property per year. So say you start with 
a duplex, for example. Maybe you decide, you know what, I'm going to live in half the duplex. I want to get the experience to, to manage uh, my, my tenants, my toilets, and all the headaches that come with it. But I want to I see and feel that, right? So I get in there. I buy this duplex. I live in half of it. Pretty much have my mortgage paid for by, by the other folks who are living in the property. And then after you know, a year or two, I decide, OK, I'm going to move up to a fourplex. So I buy a fourplex, and then I move up, and so on and so forth. So you save all the cash flow for future down payments. You trade up to larger unit numbers as uh, more income comes in. And in time, you buy the 30 unit, the 50 unit, if you are so inclined to continue going. Or you just stop where you need to stop. Ultimately, you want to set what your expectations are up front. You want to really look at where are you where are you in life? What's your end all be all goal? Do you want to be a full time real estate investor? Do you want to be part time? Do you just need enough to get by? We're doing pretty good now. We just want to make you know, a couple thousand bucks a month extra. We'll reverse engineer it, right? Think about how much you need, build a plan that builds that into it, and figure out how do you get there. All right, so step number four in the, in the plan that we're talking about is finding your property. Because we already talked about the education, we already talked about picking what you want to do. Uh, next, we want to talk about finding which property. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, we're just going to run through them real quickly, just some of the common techniques. Uh, first of all, there is the MLS. Uh, if you've ever bought or sold a house, chances are you bought and sold one off the MLS, uh, meaning a real estate agent listed it and you went and bought it. In a competitive market, especially a competitive market around here, I've heard is ridiculous. It's very, very hard to find good deals on there, but they can be found. All right, then you've got networking. So networking, you've got events, you've got, I mean, you guys have a campus. This is college campus, right? Google campus, right? I mean, Jordan's an investor. There's 30 people in here. Why don't you guys start a real estate club? I mean, the Google real estate club would be a great idea. You guys can work together, network. You guys can find deals together, work on projects, finance, things like that. Networking is an amazing way to, to build up your investments and your base. And just a real quick plug, tonight we're actually doing a meetup in San Francisco of real estate investors in town. If any of you guys want to come, you're welcome to join us. Jordan's got the information. But there's like 100 something people who are getting together to talk about real estate. No pitchiness. It's just people hanging out trying to figure it out. Another way that a lot of investors use is marketing to find good deals. This gets a little more advanced. I'm not suggesting everyone goes out and does this right away. But by marketing, meaning anything from billboards to an ad in the newspaper, an ad on Craigslist, uh, Google AdWords, I've used that to find deals. Uh, anything like that is marketing. It's, it's going on the offensive <coughs> to go and get, it, get a good deal instead of just waiting it for it to come to you. All right, then if you're looking for commercial properties, you've got sites like LoopNet, CoStar. You guys might want to write these down. Uh, there's, uh, there's these these portals where you can go out and find the listings for the commercial properties. You may not find the best deals, but if you start searching, start looking at these properties and these platforms, you could at least start to see what the numbers are. You guys are all mostly number crunchers, I'm guessing, so you can figure out kind of what works, what doesn't work uh, by by starting to experience what uh, what's out there. All right, and finally, I just want to throw out there bigger pockets, which is where uh, you know we spend our time. People come on there and sell, give away, trade whatever deals. So. Uh, moving on, next one, number five, is to pay for your investment. It's not uh, free. I mean, you, there's no such thing as a free lunch unless you work at Google. <laughs> there we go. All right. My first first laugh. Yeah, you. first laugh. Give that man a drink. All right. So you got to pay for your investment. The best way, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. I'm not going to say the best way, but we're going to run through probably, I don't know, six or seven of them real quick. First of all, number one, probably maybe most common way to pay for an investment is all cash. If you are rich or if you're investing in a cheap area, you can write a nice big check. Great. Cash is always good. People, uh, sellers love cash. So if you can offer cash, that's great. But it's not feasible. I've never done it. So let's move on. Well, and the advantage really quick of cash is that a seller is going to look at you and say, all right, this guy can close quickly, right? So it's you versus the guy who's getting the financing, conventional loans, for example. You've got cash, you come up. They know that you don't have to wait for the bank to approve the loan. They know that you could walk in and take this property off their hands. So they're more likely than not going to lean towards your offer, even if it's potentially even less because it's more secure offer. Conventional loans are pretty much what you guys have probably all bought your properties if you own a house. Uh, conventional loan, you know, your Wells Fargo, your um, Citibank, things like that. And uh, uh, conventional, you're, you're putting down 20 up to potentially 30% on, on your property, and they're going to finance the rest. So that's a conventional loan. All right, next I want to talk about government loans. Uh, how many of you guys actually own your own home? Can I ask that? Quite a few people. Did anybody use an FHA loan when they did it? 
All right, so let me explain. There's, there's an FHA. Right, FHA, there's also VA and USDA. We're not going to do it. FHA is a loan program the government has, which ensures your loan, which means you can get a cheaper uh, down payment. Uh, right, right now, it's at 3.5%. So if you're buying a $100,000 property, which I know is you know, cheap, but if you're buying 100000 for easy numbers, 3500 bucks is what you would need down. Now, granted, you have to live in that property, and uh, I think it's for a year, but it could be a duplex, triplex, or fourplex. My favorite strategy in all of real estate investing is to find a multifamily property like that, live in one of the units, rent the other ones out, move out later, and you've got that nice fixed rate, low down payment, uh, multifamily property that just provides cash flow for the rest of your life. I did that actually with a duplex that I bought. Ended up, uh, interesting note, ended up that duplex we found out years later was Kurt Cobain's very first house, uh, which is, I don't know, interesting. We found out because some Swedish tourists were knocking on the door trying to take pictures of the inside. So, yeah, fun side story. And now he owns two of Kurt Cobain's houses. Yeah. It's true. If anyone wants one, any Nirvana fans? <laughs> Does anyone like Nirvana? Nirvana? There's an investment house for sale. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Be alert. All right, portfolio loans. Portfolio loans are loans that are owned by the lender themselves. So you guys remember the housing crisis where everybody's talking about slicing and dicing loans and selling them and things like that. Portfolio loans are where a, a banking, a lending institution is going to own the loan. They're not going to sell it off. The nice thing about portfolio lenders are they love investors and they're, they're pretty easy to work with generally. Uh, if you've got good deals, they want them. So they're, they're going to want to work with you. They're not going to, you know, especially if you start to learn how to deal with lenders uh, and you can present yourself in a professional way and give them, uh, you know, your, your, your loan package and say, hey, here's a, here's a property, here's all the details, and, and you, you, you do well by it. They're going to love you. They're going to want you to keep coming back. And uh, portfolio lenders are definitely a preferred source of uh, money for most sophisticated investors. All right, the next type of loan that's pretty popular is a commercial loan. If you're going to buy a property like a large multifamily, five units and up, or if you're going to buy an office building, a uh, trailer park, whatever, you're going to want to use a commercial loan. They're very similar to portfolio in that uh, any bank can generally do a commercial loan. They usually require a little bit higher down payment, maybe 25, 30 uh, percent, but it can finance. I mean, if you can, here's a cool example of something you could do. Let's say you get 10 guys together, all <coughs> throw in $50,000, you got 500,000. You go to a bank and get a commercial loan on a $10 million property, use the 10 guys you gather together as a down payment and the commercial loan on the rest. I mean, there's a lot of fun games you can play with that uh, when you go commercial. So if you guys decide to go commercial, yeah, look into that and find a good commercial lender. And find a good real estate attorney. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't just like, hey, we're going to throw money together and we're going to do this. Like you want to, again, about the education. I know Brandon gives, uses it and it's a good example, but truth be told, you know, don't go out there and do stuff unless you've made sure that it's it's legit and it's kosher because there's a lot of there's a lot of bad information. I'm not saying his information is bad, but there's a lot of bad information out there, and you really do have to be careful of that. Uh, so uh, I, I really do recommend, and we don't talk about team at all on this, but part of your investing team absolutely should be a real estate attorney. It's one of the most important people. And thank you very much. All right, so we've got hard money lenders. Hard money lenders are kind of the loan sharks. That a lot of people think, hear of them and they think loan sharks, right? These are guys who actually loan money for short term and it's pretty expensive. They're gonna pay, you're going to pay points on it. You might be paying 12%, 15% on a hard money loan, but it's going to be a loan for six months, nine months, something like that. This is one of the preferred loans for flippers. House flippers love hard money loans uh, because they're generally the hard money lenders have an understanding of what flippers are doing. They can look at a property, say this is going to be a, a good deal. Uh, you're going to be able to turn it over fast. You have the resources. I'm going to give you the money, make my money fast, and we're all going to be happy. Hard money loans. All right, we're almost done with the different financing things, but there's also uh, private money, which would be things like family or friends. If you borrow money from somebody that you know, uh, dangerous, you know, to, to do that. Not so that you know like well, but. If you borrow money from people that you uh, might network with, that's called private money. It's usually a little bit cheaper. Uh, for example, there's a guy I know in Portland who just lent me $100,000 to go buy an investment property and then I'm gonna refinance it. Worked out really great for me, it worked out great for him, and that's a perfect like uh, private money deal. So I recommend looking into that if you're looking for financing and can't get it from a bank. All right, so that was uh, private money. 
partners and and on private money you, you want to you want to be really sure with the, the per person you're working with you know you are in bed with them so make sure you're comfortable with with the folks that you're doing that the same goes for for uh, partners so partners would be you know you and your buddy say hey you know we want to get into the game I'm gonna put up 50% you put up 50% and let's get in this deal together or you know he may be he may put up all the money you may do all the work things like that but if you if you work with folks you can come up with creative ways to potentially even do deals with with no cash out of your own pocket uh, but again you want to make sure you're very careful with who you're working with which leads us to all right, the last one I want to talk about real quick is just seller financing. What seller financing is, is when you buy a property from the person who owns it and they actually carry the mortgage. Uh, so instead of you paying a bank every month, you pay the seller every month. Actually, actually how I bought my 24 unit apartment building, uh, there was an older couple went to my church. I mentioned one day, hey, you know, I'd love to buy an apartment building. And they said, huh, you know, interesting, we actually have one. And uh, it worked out perfect. That's that networking thing we talked about earlier. Well, what we ended up doing is they ended up carrying the contract on it, which is uh, they carried the mortgage. I pay them every month. They're this like cute old couple who drive around the country in their motorhome now. And like that's their entire retirement is what I pay them every month. It works out amazing for them. Worked out great for me. And it's a really, really uh, great way to buy real estate if you can do it. It's uh, like an annuity. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. So with that, let's move on to step number six. All right. Step number six, self-management versus property management. Uh, we're, we're not really talking about flipping houses here. Now we're talking about uh, investment properties, uh, buy and hold things, uh, buy and hold properties. Uh, so self-managing, it's pretty obvious. You buy a property, you're taking care of the toilets, you're taking care of the tenants, you're taking care of the maintenance, you're taking care of the headaches, and yes, you will deal with all of that. Uh, self-managing is, it could be very challenging. Uh, it could be very fulfilling. In the end, it could be very time consuming. Uh, that said, if you're going to become a landlord and, and end up having somebody outside do it for you, definitely, definitely recommend self-managing first uh, versus property management. Property management, you're going to hire a company, they're going to take care of the property. Now that said, when I, when I told you that you know, I had a hard time and lost a lot of money, well, I did that primarily because I hired the wrong property management. I went out there, I didn't know what I was looking for, I didn't know what to do. So I went and I hired a property manager. All right, great. Property manager screwed me. Hired another property manager. Property manager screwed me. Hired another one. And it was this, this dirty trail of tears for me. And, and ultimately, uh, so you have to know, you know, you know, a passive investment, you're not necessarily, uh, when you've got these property managers, you want to know how to screen them, you want to know what to look for, and you want to make sure they're doing their job. So there, there's the active part of, of the passive investment. But in the end, again, professional property managers are gonna do the job, they're gonna take care of the asset, and they may even help you find additional deals. All right, uh, step number seven. We're gonna close this thing up here in a minute. And that is planning your exit strategy. We talked about earlier the map driving from you know, Seattle all the way down to Mexico City. You have to know where Mexico City is at in order to get there, right? So you have to know where your destination is. You may change throughout your life where that destination is, but it's still important to kind of plan for that. So we want to talk about just a few of the more common exit strategies a person might have in their investment career. So the first one would be holding on to a property forever. Uh, what I mean by that is indefinitely, right? So you might buy a bunch of rental properties with no real plan to get rid of them. And that's, that's probably okay as long as you, you know, do your uh, asset protection well so when you die your kids will get the property correctly. So there are people who do hold forever and that is a valid exit strategy. All right, selling cash out. So you know, you, you buy a property, you sell it, maybe you're flipping a house. So you buy it short term, you sell it, flip it, get another property, sell it, flip it, keep going, keep going, keep going. Again, that's a really active activity that you're gonna be doing. But you know, if, if you buy these properties at a good value, a good, good price, uh, you can potentially make a, a lot of money doing this. Again, you have to be educated to know how to buy the properties, what a good price is, how to evaluate it, that education component comes in to make sure that you don't make a mistake. With real estate investments, you really make your money on the purchase. So don't think, hey, I'm gonna make money because there's gonna be appreciation. If you are buying, betting on appreciation, you're gambling. You might as well be at the casino and, and throw you know, all your money on black. If you wanna actually purchase and, and be smart about it, you're gonna analyze the deal, you're gonna analyze the fundamentals, the area, everything that's going on, uh, and you're not gonna bet on appreciation. Think of appreciation as a bonus. All right, another strategy ties into what I talked about earlier, and that's a lot of investors choose to sell via seller financing eventually. So you get old and uh, tired of doing real estate, 
if you decide to sell all your properties to another investor, who's then gonna take care of them? Just like the older couple did for me, it can work out really well and it can carry you, you know, 20, 30 years into retirement. All right, and keep trading up. I think we had talked about that earlier with, with, with the uh, multifamily plan. You buy the multifamily, you, can, you know, hold on to it for a couple of years, collect the cash flow. Uh, you know, you're, you're paying down these mortgages. You sell that thing, trade up to the next one. There's things that are uh, called 1031 exchanges. You can actually defer taxes on the, on the purchase of the next property. Uh, so trading up is, is a pretty good strategy. I think it's one of the more preferred strategies of, of the long, longer term real estate investors. And uh, it's a great way to go. All right, well, we're just gonna wrap it up now and we're gonna kind of open up for some questions. Uh, but first of all, if you guys wanna learn more, we talked about it earlier, you know, don't pay tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn. And like I said, focus on the books, the blogs, the mentors, the forums, podcasts, things like YouTube. And there is so much free information out there. I mean, information has been uh, democratized in the real estate investing world. I mean, in any world, but especially real estate, there's so much information out there for free or for cheap uh, that I just, I can't recommend that enough is don't throw away hundreds of thousands of dollars on education. So uh, if you guys want to know more exactly what we talked about today, we uh, are the co-authors of a book called The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing. It is free, which is helpful. It's online. It's just at biggerpockets.com slash U-B-G. And uh, with that, we're just going to open it up for some questions. So if anybody has any questions at all, we, we're open books. So uh, Two questions. First of all, is the slide deck that you didn't show available on the site? It, it can be, yes. I can put it up. Yeah, there. we can put this up. Yeah. Can Basically, the question? Sure. The question was, is the slide, is the slide deck going to be, uh, can we put it up on the site? And yeah, we can. And I can, you know, get copies. Basically, the slide deck was just simple, like two words of uh, what we had read out loud, I guess, just to kind of keep right. focused. But yeah, we can throw that up there, too. And the second question, uh, many years ago, I read uh, this guy, Guy Kiyosaki. Which category is it? Uh, like Robert Kiyosaki? <coughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Rich Dad, Rich Dad. Yeah, he wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which was probably the most foundation. He, he was asking uh, about Robert Kiyosaki, where I put him. I mean, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I would say, is the number one most foundational book that most real estate investors read. Uh, I, I recommend reading the book. Uh, Rich Dad Organization has a lot more stuff. Uh, you know, you can analyze that, figure out if it's something you want to do. Uh, it can be very expensive. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book, I'd say if you're going to read one book, start with that one. It's a good motivator. It's it, a very good motivator. Yeah, it's, it's one of those books that you're going to open up. It's not a how-to book, yeah. but it's a good motivator. Yeah. What's the slash URL? UBG. <laughs> U-B-G. Yeah, Ultimate Beginner's Guide. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. What are your thoughts on short-term furnished rentals? Are short-term furnished rentals? Sure. Talking like VR, Airbnb, VRBO stuff. Yeah. Questions. Good question. All right. So his questions were, uh, first of all, uh, what do you think about short-term rentals like vacation rentals, Airbnb, or VRBO, those sites? Uh, the second question, well, I'll get to that. So the first one is, I don't personally have any. I think they're a good idea potentially, but I think a lot of people get emotion involved when you're doing it because you're like, oh, I could buy a house in, you know, I don't know, Puerto Vallarta, and it's going to be amazing. I can rent it out all year round. It's very, very expensive to manage that kind of thing. Yeah. So especially local, I mean, I would love to buy something in my area uh, that was local that people could rent because there can be a lot of money in that. A second half of that, though, is if you guys looked at the paper the other day, it was on the front page of the paper was landlords are now being sued uh, because they're breaking the law. In a lot of areas, you can't actually have short-term vacation rentals. And in the past, it's kind of been the government has kind of you know, turned the other, yeah, hand, turned yeah. the other way and not really cared. But now they're starting to go after landlords who are doing this. So. Yeah, like in New York, they're actually, uh, I think it's the AG is, is suing Airbnb to get access to, uh, to get access to the, land, the, the folks who are renting their properties out via Airbnb uh, because the hotel lobby is not happy about uh, the, that business. I know San Francisco, I think, is, is also not happy about it. So, uh, you know, I, I think with vacation rentals, a lot of people, we know folks, plenty of folks who are make, making very good money. In fact, I know a person who was a long-term landlord who basically waited till leases were up, got his, uh, got his tenants out and used, uh, transformed his property to, to short-term rentals. And uh, the amount of money he's making is considerably more with short-term rentals. But you really have to focus. Uh, there's a lot of energy to put in. Uh, your second question was real estate agent. A oh, real estate agent. You know, it's interesting. That is, 
That's one of the biggest debates that we see on our site on bigger pockets. Uh, I, I, I think the the negative people the negative to it is that you're beholden to you know follow the rules so to speak. I don't see that as a negative. Uh, you know the the best thing about a real estate license is you have access to the MLS. You have access to deals as they come up. You can write contracts, uh, and and you know presumably you're educated about what needs to be done on on the transactional side of things. So everybody that we we do a podcast and and everybody that we've interviewed on the podcast who has a real estate license has said it's absolutely worth doing. Think about it. If you're a house flipper, you know, you pay you pay you don't pay anything on the purchase, but on the sale you got to pay the the 6%, 8% approximately. So you're paying 6% in commissions every time you do it over and over again. Well, if you're the if you're the uh, agent, you know, you're you're collecting at least half of that, right? So you're saving a lot of money in the long term by by being a real estate agent and and again, you have quicker access to deals as they come up, at least on the MLS. And I do not have my real estate license. And I've, I've taken the class to do it. And then when it came down to it, I decided, personally, I, I decided I didn't want to do it. Um, I don't really know why. I mean, it was a couple thousand dollars a year at the time. And I thought, well, I don't really, I'm not really buying that much. When I look back, I regret not doing it at the time. And now I, I could go back and do it, but it's another 100 hours of work. So I probably will do it. And I guess if I had to say, Yes, I do recommend getting it, even though I don't have it. So do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, there's a question on the cool. Oh, cool. Uh, so you, you, I, I, a long time listener, first time caller, I listen to podcasts and all that stuff, right? But um, with all the optimization of information, like, why are there deals still to be had, right? So the back of my mind says that uh, if it were so easy to make a lot of money, or if it, you know, even if it were from a Yeah. Yep. So there, uh, how many? Who knows? How many people do we have here in the United States? What, 330 million? I mean, there's people die, people go bankrupt, people have divorces, people have situations where they are in a distressed situation, right? Uh, you may get hired by an investment bank in New York, and you've got to get up and move, and you got to get up and move fast. So what do you do? You got to dump it. You got to unload your property. You got to get out. So in the end, uh, if if uh, if that ever stops, then the deals will stop. But it's never going to happen. So why has the number of investors been in the that demand, right? I mean, you would think that like the number of investors would, would increase as the prices drop, right? So that's just, so take out that those hundred dollars over the pipeline. I think you're going to get me started about a political discussion about our <laughs> education system, and that's going to be a really bad uh, discussion. Where did the name Bigger Pockets come from? Uh, good question. So, Bigger Pockets came from, uh, here we go. I used to be in the entertainment business. Bigger Pockets, the name was actually originally born out of that. Uh, I, I have a buddy who was in this really cheesy indie film, and uh, he played this drug dealer, and he's sitting there with this, uh, this you know, drink in one hand and a wad of cash that he's trying to get out of his pocket. And he's just struggling and struggling, and he finally gets out, and he's like, man, I got to get Bigger Pockets. And I was like, brilliant, that name is amazing. I can do anything with that. I can build a real estate site. I can build any kind of site because it could kind of talk about really anything. So that's, that's pretty much where I came from. Um, I mean, there's, there's a few ways to do it. One of the most, I think the best ways that we talked about is networking, right? So if you go to a real estate club, every major city has real estate clubs and some of you have to be really careful out because all they are is just pitch fest and buy this product. Um, but if you can find a good, even at the bad ones, I mean, if you can find people who are interested in doing deals together, they're all one mind, right? We want to buy deals together. So that's a, a good way. Uh, there is crowdfunding. It's kind of a new it's been coming out lately. It's like Kickstarter, right? But for real estate investments, people pool their money. You don't even know who they are. Just lots of people are throwing their money in. 
But that's kind of a new, uh, exciting new twist on the real estate investment world. And we didn't really get a chance to talk about it a lot today because personally, I'm, I'm not a, I've never invested in one of them, but uh, that is a way to do it as well. Uh, I would never like go and put up an advertisement in the newspaper that says, hey, I'm looking for five partners to go and buy a property. That just seems like you're calling down trouble from the government on, you know, th there's a lot of interesting laws and stuff you have to deal with when you get into that. So I wouldn't publicly do it. So re really quick to, to extend on that. So the, the SEC, you know, the SEC is, is uh, has, oh, oh, sorry, thank you, thank you, sorry. So the, the SEC has, has a lot of rules about what you can do with raising money for whether it be a company or for real estate, uh, public offerings, things like that. I'm not gonna even try and explain any of it. I'm not a lawyer, don't pretend to be. Uh, but when you go in and bring people together, you really need your real estate attorney to make sure that you're doing it kosher. Uh, if it's you and your brother and your you know, five closest friends, fine. But once you start kind of dealing with people that are outside of your if, even people in your circle, you want to you talk to a lawyer and structure it because there's, there's a lot of intricacies with the law, so you want to make sure you're doing it uh, the right way. And on the crowdfunding thing really quickly, so a lot of these sites have come out of the Jobs Act that, that uh, you know, where, where funding is kind of, I, I guess the, the, the SEC's kind of loosened up on what's, what's allowed, but it's not like Kickstarter, right? Kickstarter, you go and you're, you're, you're donating cash, right? You're donating money for a project and you get a prize in return for that donation. With crowdfunding, you're actually investing in the property. So the government is, is pretty hardcore in there. You know, this is a very nascent uh, uh, way to finance property. And, and uh, so, you know, personally, I, I would not get into a deal that way. I, I want to watch and see what's going to happen before I, I would jump into that. So anyone else? Yeah. All right. So the question was on property management, how to find them, what to look for. Um, this is not a shameless plug, but we uh, years ago when I was dealing with all the, the chaos of my own property management, I put together uh, a, a list of questions, and it was I, I don't remember them now off the top of my head, but it's we we, we can uh, we can find a way to, to get it to you guys. But but ultimately, you know, you want to know, you know. Do you want a property manager who manages their own properties? Are they competing? You know, are they going to take tenants and put their tenants in their own properties before they put them in your properties? So you, you, know, you, you want to interview them. What's their style? What do they do with tenant screening? How careful are they in looking for tenants? What's their policy on late rents? What's their policy on contractors? How do they manage you know, broken toilets? How, you, you need to, uh, there's a thousand questions that we can, uh, we can go through. Ultimately, the key is, not just picking the first property manager that's out there. You literally want to go out there. And the same goes for real estate agents and pretty much anybody else that you're dealing with in real estate. You want to interview multiple people and you want to find out what their policies are, ask the same questions, find out what their answers are, and uh, rinse and repeat until you find somebody who fits the bill that you're looking for. I don't know if that answers it, but. I do want to throw in one more suggestion is, is get recommendations from other That's real estate idea. investors. Yeah. I mean, like anybody you can find who does this, and it's fairly easy to find them, like I said, at the real estate clubs or whatever. Get recommendations. The hands down the best way to know if something's going to be good is to know if they've been good. Uh, the best way, it's just reputation. What, what have they been to other people that are similar to you? So if you can find that question out, uh, get referrals. You can find, I mean, if you ask me, there's five property management in my town, companies in my town, I'll tell you four of them do not go near. There's one that I would use. I don't use them yet, but I will someday. But the other four, I wouldn't use it. And I'm, I'm happy to tell you that because I want you to succeed. Real estate investors love to help each other. It's not a, that competitive of a business as you might think. Uh, everybody I've ever known has been very open to share and to say, here, do this, don't do this. Well, and, and, and actually, on that, on that subject of competition, you know, a, lot, a lot of new investors will come out and say, oh, well, you know, I'm competing. You know, it kind of goes to the question about all these investors jumping on deals. You know, I'm competing with all these guys. Well, people who've been investing for you know more than one or two deals typically look at their competitors as collaborators. Um, you know, you you may say, hey, Brandon. You know, you may go and find a deal. You may do marketing. You know, send out letters to people who are in distressed situations, and say, you know, come up with people, somebody whose whose mom just died and needs to get rid of a property. And you know what? You don't have cash at this point because you just bought another property, right? So three days later, after you bought a property, a phenomenal deal comes in. Well, you know, Brandon's looking for a similar type property. Well, I'm gonna work with Brandon to get the deal done. 
I'm not going to make as much as I might have made otherwise, but at least I can make some money, or at least I can give it over to him. He can make some money and you know, pay back, scratchy, scratchy. So um, investors like to work together, and, and if you can collaborate and not think of the other investors in your area as competitors, you're going to do way better than the folks who do think that way. Any other questions? Let's go you no, Oh. What was that? Um, sorry, I'll go first again. All right. I can't, I can't hear you guys, by the way, so if someone's asking a question earlier, really, I have no idea. All right. Um, so my question is, um, so you said it's really, it's really expensive up front to invest in the Bay Area for real estate. Uh, would you recommend for a first-time investor to invest locally, or would you say for that to invest in another less expensive market at first? Sure. Uh, this is a really... This question comes up all the time, right? You guys live in a very expensive area. People, when we're talking, they say, well, I live in LA, I live in San Francisco, I live in New York, I can't invest. My belief is that within 100 miles of any location, there is good places to invest. Within a, within a two hour drive or so, you can get to a good location. I mean, I know like uh, Jordan bought a property uh, nearby that actually makes sense for him. So I mean, there's places nearby, that's probably what I would recommend. Uh, and again, it goes back to the niche and strategy thing too, right? So some niches might be very difficult in some areas. Some strategies might be very difficult. Like I'm not, flipping doesn't work real well in my area because prices are really low. They can't really shoot high. But around here, people make, I mean, millions a year on flipping houses. I'm not saying go out and flip houses, but certain strategies, certain areas. So that would be my uh, you know, thought on that. I don't have anything to add, but. Um, no, I mean, ultimately, again, y you can find deals. Whether you're in New York City, you're in LA, you're in San Francisco. Uh, yeah. Jordan, your, your property's out in Sacramento, right? Yes. So um, what's that, two, two plus hours? I mean, within a couple hours drive, you can find good deals from any city in, in, the, in the country. Now that said, from my own personal experience, the first properties I bought were 2,000 miles away. Do not do that. Seriously, don't do that. Because you can't just get in your car and get there. And, and I, I can't tell you how important that is, at least when you're starting, and learning about all these things and dealing with fires because you're going to deal with fires no matter what in the beginning and to be able to get to those properties drive by see that it still hasn't been burning down or whatever you know you, you want to be able to, to have quick and easy access and other questions thanks yeah What do you do? That's a really good question. That's a great question. Yeah, let me, yeah, I'll repeat that question real quick. He basically said his first property he bought, uh, as a, like he lived in the property, then he moved and bought another house, so he rented the first one out. Then he did that again, and you can do that a few times. But every time you do it, when you go to a bank to try to get a loan, they're gonna only count part of the income that comes in towards income. The bank is going to say, well, we're only going to give you 75% of what comes in. So the more you buy, the harder it gets. And this is one of the really frustrating questions a lot of investors have is pretty soon the banks start saying no very quickly. I mean, I got to, I think, and there's also limits like a lot of banks say you cannot have more than four. We're going to cap you at four. And so these two problems, right? I mean, like they're both kind of related. Banks will just have a flat ceiling. You can't have more than four or uh, your debt to income it's called, which is getting a little complicated, but your ratios don't work out. Sorry, you're denied. What I say is, for somebody who's got a little bit of creativity, uh, you can work around it. But my favorite method of doing this, this is what I've done a number of times, is I work with a partner. We talked about partners. This is why I do it. So what I'll do is I'll find a partner who has great credit, uh, great income. Uh, he can qualify for a loan. He can go to a bank. He doesn't own any rental property, really. But he likes what I do, and he's got what I don't have is the ability to get another mortgage. We say, okay, let's do this together. Uh, you know, we'll use your income and credit. You know, I'll find the deal, we'll put the thing together, and we'll just split everything 50-50 later on. It doesn't have to be 50-50. You get what you need to negotiate. But what that enables is the bank doesn't look at me anymore. They're looking at him. Even though I'm still on title on the property, it's just a nice way to use somebody else's income and work together. Uh, you have to you know, find the right partner to do that. But that's one way. Otherwise, we talk about portfolio loans. Uh, portfolio loans are how a lot of investors do it. I got a portfolio lender right now, just a local bank, a 
in my area, and they flat out told me, you know, like, oh yeah, you can get as many loans as you want, it's okay, we don't have a max, because we keep them in-house. We're not selling them up to big, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac institutions that cap you at a certain number. As long as the deal looks okay, we're gonna keep doing them for you all day long. So. Yeah, and, and, and the, the portfolio yeah. lenders is, they're gonna look at the deal. They're gonna look at the person, they're gonna look at the deal, they're gonna look at the experience. They're gonna say, you know what, Brandon, you've been doing this for a while, I like the numbers, you're paying on time, you know, this next property that you've got looks great, great, here's your money. I mean, you know, I, I, I know, I mean, you, you'll text your, your agent and, and pick up a deal and then you, you, you know, basically uh, send it over, email it over, and so the next thing you know, you, you got the money. I mean, it really becomes that easy as you get the experience if you're working with somebody who sees what you're doing, sees the better, it's not gonna happen you know, when, you, when you first start. But you wanna definitely search out portfolio lenders, they're definitely gonna be a great asset. And, and to find them, in case you're wondering, if anybody wants to know how to find portfolio lenders, easiest way, pick up the phone and just start calling. I, I mean, I would estimate, I don't know these numbers, but I'd estimate 20 to 30% of all banks out there are portfolio lenders. That might be high, I don't know. But if you call enough, like I, we interviewed a guy a couple weeks ago, he said he called 50 people and he got two or one or two of them to say, yeah, we'll do a loan like that, we're portfolio lenders. Not, a, not all of them use that language, they might not say portfolio lenders, but the idea is, do you keep your loans in house? Or do you sell them to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac? That's what would define a portfolio lender. So just calling all of them, steer clear of the big banks. I mean, anything that's national, go to different states, those ones aren't gonna be portfolio lenders. It's the small community banks, the credit unions, the ones that you kind of see in your neighborhood, you know, you know that they got a dozen, two dozen branches. Those are the ones you wanna focus on. So. You had a question. Uh, yeah, do you recommend holding your properties in LLC? Can you repeat that? LLC. Oh. Yeah, do you recommend holding your properties in LLC? I mean, I can tell you I personally do hold them in an LLC, but I can't say that that's necessarily the best thing for everyone. There are you know, a, a lot of different things. So we have to you know, use a disclaimer, talk to your lawyer, find out what works for them. But my lawyer told me an LLC works well. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm again not gonna tell you what to do, but some people will hold single properties in an LLC, some people will take an LLC for all their A-type properties, take another LLC for all their B-type, another LLC per partnership, um, or they'll do, I mean, th there's a million things that you, you really can do, but again, you, you wanna talk to your attorney and your accountant to figure out what the best structure for, for yourself is. Anyone else? That's it? We'll be around afterwards if you guys wanna talk at all too, so. Yeah, well, thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate it. Yep, thank you.